Well, um, thanks very much, Alison, for allowing us to talk about HLB um, citrus screening today. So what is HLB, where is it, and what is the threat was um, what we were to talk about today. So HLB is a disease of citrus that impacts citrus in a lot of areas around the world. It's caused by a bacteria, and that bacteria is spread between trees by an insect vector, the psyllid. So today I'm going to focus on the bacterial side and Luke will talk about the, the vector. So what is HLB? As I said, it's a disease of citrus. It's caused by three different Librobacter species. That's the Americanus, the Asiaticus and the Africanus. Um, in, in Africa, they've also found another, uh, some other Librobacters in rotaceous plants, but at the moment they're not affecting citrus. Uh, the disease symptoms are caused by uh, the bacteria infecting and multiplying in the plant phloem. And on the right hand side here, you can see the um, long bacterial cells inside that phloem tissue. As I said, the disease is spread, the uh, bacteria is spread by psyllids, and that's the Asian citrus psyllid and or the African, African citrus psyllid. I just wanted to talk about uh, disease symptoms of HLB. So what's really typical with HLB is the asymmetrical yellow modeling of the leaves, which is sometimes called blotchy model. Um, and then you can also get smaller, thicker leaves. There can be an upright habit to the, the growth, the plant growth, and the mid ribs the, of the leaves can be porky and enlarged. Um, as the, the disease progresses on the tree, you'll get one or more yellow shoots forming, and then eventually you'll get larger sections of the tree becoming yellow, and then eventually the whole tree can um, be affected. And this is another typical aspect to HLB that sort of sets it apart, I guess, from nutritional disorders, which can also look yellow. And that's that uneven appearance of the symptoms. The bacteria is really unevenly distributed in the tree. And that's why you get the um, asymmetric uh, type of symptoms. Uh, eventually you will get uh, defoliation, stunting and dieback. And you can see on this mature tree, there's uh, already starting to have leaf drop and some yellowing as well on those branches. Uh, the other really typical symptom of HLB is the fruit symptoms, and you get this lopsided fruit development and uneven ripening, and that seems to be quite consistent with HLB. And you can get brown uh, aborted seeds inside the fruit. Um, the fruit also tastes more acidic and bitter. So it's important to note here that, the, that this disease not only affects uh, fresh fruit pr production systems, but it also affects juice fruit for juice production and that systems as well. Uh, this slide is um, really uh, a good illustration of the impact that HLB can have on an on a orchard. You get this premature, premature fruit drop. So there's lots of fruit on the ground here, but this tree in the front on the left-hand side is almost dead. And there's one up further. I don't know if you can see that that is even more dead. So. Um, that gives you an idea of just the impact that can have on an orchard and those trees won't recover um, and you know they'll need to be removed and replaced. Uh, so you can also get off season flowering with HLB which obviously affects uh, production windows and yields um, and the psyllids can spread the, the bacteria from an infected plant before it actually shows symptoms. Uh, and I just have a note here of the three species the Africana species is heat sensitive and you do get a diminishing um, of the symptoms when the temperatures get up above 27 degrees and there's an optimum range there given for that bacteria. So if you're monitoring for it, um, you need to be careful about when you're looking. And it also means that the Africanus, as you'll see later, the Africanus um, species is differently distributed geographically because of that temperature sensitivity. Um, I just take an opportunity here to say um, the photos that I've been the photos I've used for the symptoms have come from this uh, really good review paper and also from the EPPO uh, Global Database website. That database is really, really good. There's lots of really useful information on that. Um, and I'd also say Alison will distribute our presentations. And at the end of the presentation, there's a whole list of references for where we got the information for today's talk. So where is HLB? So it depends on the species of the Librobacter that you're talking about. And this is from EPPO database. And as you can see for the Asiaticus species, it's globally distributed. It's in lots and lots, lots of major citrus growing areas. And the date in the brackets is 
the date that that map was last updated. So that's a really recent update. Um, the Americanas is basically still, as of last year, is still um, restricted to Brazil. And the Africanus one is pretty much Africa. So there's a big difference in geographical spread of the three species. What's the threat? So there's a big threat uh, to economic production uh, of citrus around the world where this occurs. And just as one, as one example, in the 10 years or 11 years after it was first detected in Florida, it cost $8 billion. And I can imagine, I can't imagine actually what the cost is now because they're still struggling to control it in Florida. Uh, other than economic, in, uh, economic impacts, it also affects food security and supply of citrus. And, you know, citrus is an important part of people's diets. Um, so which is the threat? Is it Which of the three species is the threat? Um, you can argue that the Asiaticus is the biggest threat because it's spread around the world more. It's, it is more invasive. It has a broader host range and it's more efficiently vectored by the psyllids. So it does have a higher likelihood of establishment in a, in a new country or a new production area within a country. However, all three of them can affect the commercial citrus um, varieties and species. So they all do equally have the same threat from the point of um, view of impact to production. There's some geographic and host range overlaps between the three species. And bacteria being bacteria like to swap genetic material. So there's also a threat of new strains and species emerging when you're getting that overlap, particularly when you're getting it in the same host, because that gives direct opportunity. Just thinking about host range, on the left-hand side, that list uh, refers to the Asiatica species. Uh, what I want you to note about this slide is the ones in green are the species, are major hosts for the whole three of the Librobacter species. And they represent um, all of the commercial uh, species and varieties of citrus that are grown. So you can see it will have a massive impact uh, where you grow citrus. Uh, the, the species highlighted in pink are hosts that are shared between the Asiatica species and the Africana species. And Morea pigniculata down the bottom here is a species that's shared between the Americanus Librobacter and the Asiaticus Librobacter. The other thing to note, uh, the hosts that are highlighted in grey, they're the hosts that aren't in the Rutaceae family. So these Librobacters that affect citrus are largely confined to the Rutaceae family. Um, it's only these sort of experimental ones and weeds that are, that are outside um, Rutaceae. Just a final comment on host range though. Host range is as good as the, um, the amount of study that has been done into the host range. And because Asiaticus is, you know, so globally distributed, um, there's a lot more people working on it. And it's possible that the other two Librobacter species have wider host range, but people haven't had the opportunity, the same opportunities to study it as what they have for the Asiaticus one. So what is the threat? So as I said, they all can be a threat. So you need to know which one you've got so you can focus your efforts on that. I said before, the Africana species is heat sensitive, so it has a restricted range and it also, um, it, it loses those symptoms when it gets warm. And just as an example, in Brazil, they had both the Asiaticus and the Americanus uh, Librobacters, but within five years, the Asiaticus um, species displaced the Americanus one. Um, it's more invasive, the vector spreads it more efficiently and it has, and again, it has that wider host range. So it's important to um, know which one you have. And, and as I said before, you can all, there could be new ones coming, which will have different biology again. It is a threat because HLB is extremely difficult to manage um, in, in many areas around the world, particularly in large um, commercial orchards. So before I move on to monitoring and management, I just wanted to quickly go through the disease cycle because from my point of view, the disease cycle really drives how you manage, how you monitor and how you manage. So um, the psyllid feeds on an infected tree for about an hour to um, acquire the bacteria. And then it takes about 17 days for that bacteria to circulate within the insect and get into the salivary glands and then it's available, the silicon then transmit it to a healthy tree. And then it, once it's in, deposited in a healthy tree, it takes a few weeks for that tree to, uh, for the bacteria to multiply enough in that tree 
uh, and spread enough in that tree to be a significant source for further spread. And we call this persistent transmission because once the uh, psyllid has acquired that bacteria and the latency period's finished, uh, it can transmit that, uh, can spread that uh, bacteria for basically the rest of its life, which is around about 35 days. Uh, once a tree becomes infected, it can take months or years um, until it spreads without over the whole tree and then the tree eventually defoliates and dies. So it's important to know this so that if you're monitoring and you're managing, you need to know whether you're monitoring, whether you want to monitor the infected trees or the psyllids and whether you're looking at external or internal sources of the bacteria or the or the psyllid. And it, it lets you find um, opportunities where you can have um, impact on that spread. So to monitor, um, you, you need to sample trees with suspected inf infections, which are symptomatic, and multiple tissues if you can. Um, and even when you're subsampling for, say, like a DNA test, you'd want to take some the subsamples from around the symptomatic tissue and make sure you're getting some midribs um, and multiple ones of those. And that, that all helps your chances of detection. Um, I wouldn't sample asymptomatic trees uh, because the uniformity on the tree is, is poor. And even if it is infected, the titer of the bacteria will be less um, than if you target a symptomatic uh, tissue. Diagnostics underpins monitoring, it always does. And with the new techniques that they've got out these days, uh, whole genome sequencing is likely to expand the taxonomy of this group. So we are probably likely to see more species and strains described. And there'll be new assays continually developed for this. EPPO has a diagnostic test that you can test the insect vectors for, um, for HLV. But just a note on testing insect um, insects uh, for pathogens, and it, this applies to all insect spread uh, pathogens. Uh, it can tell you what a putative vector might be if it's a new species that you're insect species that you're looking at. But the molecular techniques can just pick up gut gut contents, so what the insect's been feeding on. So it's not necessarily a vector, and you need to do a, a more work, proper transmission work, to confirm um, a new species as a vector. Um, so management, so I'm just going to talk about management of the bacteria. So there's been a few recent studies on using antibiotics. Uh, antibiotics are commonly used in the USA for bacterial diseases of plants. Uh, both these studies found trunk injection was more effective than folia and that streptomycin could be found in root and leaf tissue um, up to 12 months after injection. So that's really important important that longevity of the product to really control that bacterial titer. However, they did note there were concerns of um, presence of that antibiotic in fruit tissue. So that does, you know, have concerns for human consumption. And there was some phytotoxicity. Uh, the second study also looked at oxytetracycline, which was also good. Um, and their streptomycin results were a little bit con contradictory to the first one, but they had different methods. And I guess that highlights the importance for doing lots of different studies at, for different application times, different amounts of product, and with that knowledge of the source sink and flush events in citrus to make sure you get the product where you need to get the product when you need it there. So I'm sure there's going to be a lot more work on this coming through in the next few years. This was That paper was only last year. So some novel options for management. Um, so silver, na silver nanoparticles are, again, something that's been looked at recently, not just for HLB, but for other bacterial diseases. Silver is a really good um, antibacterial. And again, they found trunk injection was more effective and it did reduce the bacterial titer a lot. Um, and other people are looking at, you know, combining silver nanoparticles with things like amino acids to get uh, better uptake into plants. So that's a really interesting area and I'm sure we're going to see more about that in the next few years. The selenium nanoparticles was also an interesting um, study and the, the research has definitely demonstrated that it activated physiological, biochemical and antioxidant defence systems. And they're proposing that this will um, ameliorate the symptoms of HLB, but they didn't specifically measure that. Um, but it was only a paper from last year, so they might be having another one come out soon that shows more about how it's affecting disease. 
Um, in Argentina, they're looking at GMOs and they have some for their top three and they're looking at HLB, top three diseases of citrus. CRISPR-Cas9 is um, a new thing that's come out in the last few years for creating resistant and tolerant plants. And these are considered non-GMOs because you're just editing a plant gene, you're not adding something to it. Um, but behind that system, you need to know an awful lot about plant microbe interaction. So there needs to be a lot of work still done on that for HLB before we see those coming through, but I'm sure we will see something. Um, and somatic fusion for HLB breeding was really interesting. And that's where they take somatic, somatic cells of citrus australassica, which is tolerant to HLB, and fuse it with the somatic cells of, um, of citrus varieties that they want to grow. And you get this allo tetraploid cell, which is basically a cell that has all of the chromosomes. And then they can screen that out to find the ones that they want and use that in breeding. Um, so that's quite an interesting novel approach for breeding. And I think the last two I have, uh, these ones are targeted for the psyllid rather than the bacteria. So these OM8 derived, OMA derived peptides are outer membrane protein A peptides from the Asiatica species, which aren't present in the, aren't present in the Americana species. And the researchers propose that might mean that they won't be spread by Asian citrus psyllid because the Americana species isn't spread by Asian citrus um, psyllid. And they did find this PEP6. So um, when they fed that to the psyllids, the psyllids were no longer able to pick up the uh, Librobacter. And what was really encouraging was that was maintained for three months stably inside the plant. So a lot of these novel molecular products are good, but if they don't survive in the real world and don't survive for long enough in the real world, they, um, they're not useful. So three months is pretty good, I would think, for something like that. And the last one is RNAi, so RNA, interfering RNAi products, which basically silence genes in the psyllid vector. And there's been a lot of work on this, um, not just on psyllids, but a whole range of um, uh, plant pests. And in this particular study, they were able to demonstrate they could alter wing development, increase sensitivity in, to insecticides and disrupt sucrose metabolism. So again, again, that's a really recent paper. So it's going to be really interesting over the next three to five years to see where all of this new research is going. I'm sure they're going to get some, um, some useful uh, uh, products coming out that can be applied. And I think that's me done. Just a summary, uh, know what you're monitoring and you're managing. There's multiple species. There's lots of new